one of the first cold winter nights of 2017, I'm sitting in front of our fireplace, relaxing with a glass of red wine, when I suddenly became aware of our now empty nest. A weird thought came to me. If I was an insect, I would be fast approaching the end of my life cycle. I distinctly recall being very grateful that I'm human. A few, weeks, a few weeks later, I was looking through the folders of an old memory stick that my dad used to save his documents on that he was still actively working on. My eye caught a folder that I haven't noticed before um, named Flitzer in Afrikaans, translated flashes. And um, I opened it and it contained a single word document and within that it was exactly what the name suggested. It was, he captured flashes of thoughts, ideas, philosophical moments and unfinished poems. There was one poem that sort of was of particular interest to me um, and it read in Afrikaans, Ek wat geen God wil hee, wil soms toch ook net dankie sê. Direct translation, I, who don't want a God, occasionally also wants to say thank you. I found it very strange that my dad made such a strong correlation between gratitude and religion. He was an atheist, albeit with a very good knowledge of the Bible and Buddhism. So this stimulated me to start reading a little bit and start to explore a bit what, what, what gratitude is all about. We are grateful for things that we receive, perhaps a gift, a favor, an opportunity. There should be no strings attached and no um, expectation that you need to repay or um, need to reciprocate. But we can also be grateful for things in everyday life like clean running water from our taps. So let me start at the beginning. In fact, your and my beginning. We can all be grateful for the fact that we were born in the first place. The chances of you being born as a unique individual have been calculated by a chap called Dr. Ali um, Binazar. He's a graduate of the Harvard College and Cambridge University and a trained physician and uh, behavioral change therapist. So he came to the conclusion that you being born, the chances of that is one in 10 to the power of 2,685,000. So to put that into perspective, if you take two and a half million people, let's say half of the New Zealand population, gather them around in one place, give them a trillion sided dice to roll, and they each make do a roll, and each of their roles come up with the exact same number, that is the chances of you being born you. So something to be grateful for. Um, the more I read about gratitude, the more I realized that there's a big difference of being occasionally grateful and actually living a grateful life. Living a grateful life can have a significant positive impact on our health, our well-being and happiness. But it does take some effort. You have to pay attention and develop an appreciation for everyday life and events. I decided to try and introduce this into my own life and to make things a little bit easier and to memorize it, I made use of um, the three P's. Uh, pause, perceive and proceed. So first of all, you need to pause, you need to stop what you're doing and actually take time out and clear your mind um, and then use your senses to actually um, take note of what has just happened or what is actually happening. And there's so many gifts, luxuries and opportunities we experience and are presented with every day that just sort of passes us by. Um, so then you need to move on to proceed. Most of the time, really, you just don't need to do anything, you just need to acknowledge um, the um, gift that you've just been given and sort of move on. But sometimes the gift is actually an opportunity, an opportunity to do something, an opportunity to make a decision about. Um, 
And as doctors, we are actually absolutely spoiled with opportunities. Um, we have an opportunity every day of our lives to help people, to make a difference, to improve their lives. But how often do we actually pause, perceive, and um, acknowledge the opportunity and be grateful for it? I found this a very enriching experience, and it gave me a new perspective on my life. But then I came to realize something horrible. There were several instances where I caught myself being grateful for things that actually did not happen to me. Something bad happens to another person, and I caught myself thinking, thank God, that could so easily have been me. It struck me that that is one of the most selfish things a person can ever think or say. Awful things, um, it implies that it's okay if things happen to other people as long as it doesn't happen to you. Awful things have happened and keeps happening to my colleagues all the time. Enough is enough, I thought. I had to do something about this. We have to do something about it, if only for selfish reasons. If it can happen to our colleagues, then given enough time, chances are it will happen to us as well. Dr. Andrew Bryant's wife opened up about his death in an email to friends, family, and colleagues. The email went viral. Andrew was a gastroenterologist for 20 years doing private and public work. He had no history of depression, but over a period of time, she noticed he was more anxious about his patient administration, about some of his patients, and about his own competence. He already had a bad sleeping pattern, but this deteriorated further. He had an awful week on call, being called every night, sometimes three to four times over the night. But the following morning, he continued with his daytime endoscopy lists and continued to see his patients. He missed his son's birthday that week and every other dinner. On the Tuesday night, he was upset and teary after a patient has died. He was always upset when any of his patients died, but his level of distress in this case was unusual. On the Thursday morning, he took his own life in his office. She points out that no one saw it coming. He was a doctor. He was surrounded by health professionals every day. Both his parents were psychiatrists. Two of his brothers were doctors. His sister is a psychiatric nurse. None of them saw it coming. In the October 2017 issue of the New Zealand Doctor, Cliff Taylor recounts the challenge and the shame of burnout for two general practitioners, Dr. Lucy O'Hagan and Joe Scott Jones. The burnout was bad, Dr. Lucy says, but the shame was crippling. Shame is worse than failure. She hit the wall, broke down, went over the edge. It felt like a head injury, she says. I should have stopped two years before. Dr. Joe Scott Jones recalls that all the signs were there. He started to show symptoms of depression. He was quite teary, crying on the way home from work quite often. He had transient self-destructive thoughts. If I drifted the car over the other way, nobody would mind. Although he says he was not actively suicidal. Then he recounts, I've been asking people subsequently, and everybody has a burnout story. Some are not open to sharing it, but most of us have been there. Both GPs have called for changes in the culture of medicine, which prevents doctors from seeking help. Ron Patterson and John Adams published an article in the New Zealand Medical Journal titled Professional Burnout, a Regulatory Perspective. They discuss the issues we now know too well, but also highlight the additional stress a doctor experience from mistakes and complaints. Albert Wu has called the doctor who makes a mistake the second victim of medical error. Oh, I'll go. 
go back there, sorry. Six years ago, they suggested changes in three areas to prevent and alleviate burnout. A cultural change, so there needs to be a culture change within the health professions so that practitioners feel able to seek help. Support services, employers and colleges need to do a much better job of supporting doctors facing stress of any sort. Responsive regulators, regulators need to handle complaints and inquiries promptly and sensitively. That was six years ago. Have we made any progress since then? Research done by Dr. Charlotte Chambers of the ASMS reveals that presenteeism was reported by 88% of respondents over a 24-month period. This was followed by the revelation that 50% of hospital specialists report symptoms of burnout. Nearly half said this was due to their work. During the course of this year's annual conference, you are going to hear about the prevalence and impact that bullying and bad behavior in the workplace has. Our ongoing survey of clinical leaders on senior medical staffing needs highlights significant understaffing at SMO levels across those DHBs we've actually surveyed so far. Does this paint a picture of a safe work environment that will help you stay healthy and keep your patients safe? A supportive work environment that encourages you to seek help. Presenteeism, bullying, burnout. We make the mistake to think these are diagnoses. They are not diagnoses. They are symptoms. They are symptoms of a healthcare system that have significant problems. It is taking its toll on the workforce and in turn adversely affects patients' care. We have gone well beyond the keep calm and carry on point. The cost of doing nothing is huge. The scene at the bottom of the cliff is absolutely awful. Doctors whose careers and family lives have been destroyed. Doctors in rehabilitation doctors needing mental health intervention, and sadly, headstones marking the graves of colleagues. The situation at the top of the cliff is complex. In 2011, there was a publication in the archives of surgery entitled Special Report, Suicidal Ideation Among American Surgeons. Out of 7,905 participants, 501 reported suicidal ideation during the previous 12 months. Only 130 surgeons with a recent suicidal ideation actually sought help. 60% were reluctant to seek help. What figures are available for SMO seeking help in New Zealand? Dr. Tim Cookson of the MPS was kind enough to share the number of SMOs that sought counseling from the MPS MAS counseling service over the past five years. I wouldn't call that an upward trend, but the numbers are going up. But what I find quite shocking, although there, there are several counseling services in New Zealand, um, this is certainly not the only one, but this represents less than 1% of the SMO workforce. Tim Cookson and Wayne Cunningham published an article in the NZMJ in, the, in August 2009 outlining the experience of doctors using their funded counseling service. And they concluded the MPS funded counseling service is effective and well received, but there is an insufficient awareness of its availability. The reason for not seeking help are multiple and complex but it's actually well known. A major obstacle in seeking help is the culture of shame and the fear we will end up being reported to the medical council. We somehow believe we have failed if we seek help. So let's move away from the cliff's edge and consider some of the factors that might influence the current epidemic. It is clear that we need a cultural shift. I agree with Ron Patterson John Adams, and more recently, Dr. Sam Hazeldean, 
whose successful petition led to an addition to the Declaration of Geneva. I will attend to my own health, well-being and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. Will this in itself solve the problem? No, but it is certainly a step in the right direction. I strongly feel we also have a responsibility for the health of our colleagues. If we don't look out for each other, who will? The healthcare system in New Zealand is under tremendous pressure. We are caught up in a vicious cycle, and our employer, the, this includes the Ministry of Health and the previous Minister of Health, somehow just doesn't grasp this. So the results of a vicious cycle is that things keep getting worse and worse. If we compare that with a virtuous cycle, where you actually have desirable outcomes, and things just keeps getting better with each cycle. Cycles are complex chains of events, and there's no tendency to equilibrium. They'll just keep going round and round until there's an external factor that intervenes and breaks the cycle. You have the right to work in a healthy and safe environment. Our employer district health boards are responsible for managing their work-related health and safety risks. Are they fulfilling their legal obligation? Motivating healthcare workers with slogans like the recently retracted, don't stop when you're tired, stop when you are done, is highly inoffensive. DHB should be held accountable for the current damaging work environment that exists and the lack of progress in addressing it. Ron Patterson and John Adams also said, employers and colleges need to do a much better job of supporting doctors facing stress of any sort, including from the impact of mistakes and complaints. Our mecca is actually quite clear. The employer shall ensure the investigation is undertaken as sensitively as reasonably possible with respect to the employee and encourage the employer to seek appropriate professional and other support through the process. This time period is very stressful for clinicians. There are enough research and publications out there to support this fact. In reality, what encouragement is actually given and or offered? Is there ongoing follow-up and monitoring of the clinician to be sure that he or she is coping and staying safe and did in fact seek help? The literature is clear that there are complex factors at play here. And are you okay is simply not good enough. A referral to the Medical Council um, or Health and Disability Commissioner is one of the most stressful events in any doctor's life. We know this. The Medical Council does have a health committee, but its primary objective is to protect the public's health and safety and then address the doctor's health afterwards. The Medical Council seems to have no obligation to ensure the safety of the doctor or take into consideration whether the doctor is actually fit to stand trial. It will, however, decide whether the doctor is fit to practice afterwards. After much research, I discovered the existence of the Doctor's Health Advisory Service, which is actually partially funded by the Medical Council of New Zealand. Don't spend your time looking for the website. There isn't anyone. There's a phone number hidden away in a pamphlet. So I want to actually put some solutions forward today, and I want us to discuss this uh, tomorrow again. Yunus Pro Omnibus Omnes Pro Uno. One for all, all for one. This term was first recorded in a meeting in 1618 attended by leaders of the Bohemian, Catholic, and Protestant communities. A representative of the Protestants read a letter affirming, we would stand firm with all for one and one for all. Nor would we be subservient, but rather we would loyally help and protect each other to the utmost against all difficulties. We are not insects. We are indeed human, and it's got advantages and disadvantages. To err is human, 
We practice the first rule of medicine, first do no harm. But yet when it comes to dealing with our colleagues, we have a very narrow bandwidth of what we tolerate both culturally and professionally. We need to replace bullying with random acts of recognition and supporting each other. Support also includes providing advice sensitively given where a colleague might need further cultural proficiency or professional development. There's an old African proverb, the one who walks alone by the river gets eaten. I want us to seriously consider establishing a pastoral care department in each DHB. Pastoral care is an ancient model of emotional and spiritual support. We know doctors are very reluctant to seek help or report bullying. We know half of us have reported symptoms of burnout. We know receiving a complaint, a referral to HDC or the medical council is extremely stressful. Do we sit back and wait for a doctor to seek help? Do we soothe our conscience by fulfilling our duty and inform a doctor in distress that they should seek help? Or do we actually proactively provide help and walk alongside them and support him or her through a very difficult time? I want to challenge the Medical Council of New Zealand to review their current processes in dealing with doctors and practitioners that have been referred to them. They should firstly establish that the doctor is fit to stand trial and ascertain that support has been put into place to keep the doctor safe during the process. Is it acceptable for the Medical Council to hide behind the we are responsible for protecting the health and safety of the public. My colleagues and I and friends are also members of the public and also have mental health needs and a right to professional help and protection against self-harm and destruction while the medical council's processes run their course. The work environment, we cannot allow for burnout and bullying to continue. DHBs can no longer stand by, sorry, DHBs can no longer stand by idly and address their current working conditions so conducive to bullying and burnout. They have a legal responsibility to provide us with a safe work environment we have to intervene and break the cycle. I'm fully aware that the new government has inherited a public health service that has been under-resourced for a number of years. I implore the new Minister of Health, the Director General of Health, the Treasury, not to distance themselves from this, but to recognize their responsibility and be part of the solution. You cannot harm or attack doctors or any member of the healthcare team without impacting on patient safety and care. I'm sure the Health Quality and Safety Commission is very aware of this fact. You will have an opportunity tomorrow to explore the topic of bullying further and as well as discussing the above proposed solutions. I would love to hear your thoughts and have your input. Please seek help. There is no shame in it. Thank you.